Well, good morning and welcome to you again, Hannah. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning. Thank you for having me again. So today we're going to have a, a conversation about um, experiencing loss during lockdown, which I'm sure a lot of people have um, experienced a similar thing and, and all the difficulties that came with it. So could you please perhaps start um, to talk to us about um, that theme for today, please? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, so certainly I think that it's something that a lot of people will resonate with. Um, you know, there was a lot of stories I know um, around the time, you know, of a lot of people going through loss, whether that was, um, you know, whether it was stillbirth, whether it was, you know, kind of, um, you know, sort of a little bit further after kind of you know neonatal or a bit further after again or even um sort of you know some women who maybe find out that they had had a miscarriage and they had to find that information out on their own um you know so it, it was a it most certainly was was very very difficult um I think I would say that you know kind of going through baby loss at any stage as, as you know as we all will know in this community who's been through it it's a very isolating experience by itself um and whenever you throw in that kind of you know physical lockdown where you you can't go anywhere you know you can't really do anything it mm -hmm. does make it a lot more challenging because you know the normal things you might have I mean I remember whenever we had just got our diagnosis it was it was June 2020 so it was right mm -hmm. in the in, at the height of lockdown and you know it was things like we couldn't um there was no maybe kind of like parent and baby groups you know or sort of pregnancy groups you know where you would have naturally made a couple of friends and you would have been able to open up you know that didn't really happen um there was, you know, everything was kind of closed. So there was no real, you know, there, there was nothing, no real escape. You know, there was nowhere to kind of go when, you know, sort of think or, or do anything else. Um, I suppose even a simple thing like having your friends come over when, when they've heard the news and having a cup of tea with you or going to visit your family and sharing, you know, your news and your story. Just those simple things were all taken away from us, weren't they? Yeah, they they absolutely were. I mean, you know, my friends were were really good. My family were amazing with things like phone calls and, and video mm. calls. But, you mm. know, yourself, it's just not the same. You know, whenever yeah. you've had, whenever you really just want, to, you know, you want to hug and you want to kind exactly. of you know, talk about it. Yeah, it's, it's just really exactly. not the same. So it, it definitely was very, very difficult. Mm. Mm. Um. And what other challenges did you face, um, you know, with regards to lockdown, um, losing Killian at that time? So, I mean, a, a lot of the other challenges we had was in, you know, so in the hospital that we had Killian, um, they have a specific room, um, which is called the snowdrop room. And that is for anybody who is um, either going through stillbirth or who's been given. So for us, we were obviously given the diagnosis and we were told they didn't expect Killian to live. So we went to this room, um, you know, wh which was lovely. It was separate, um, you know, from any, from any other uh, mothers who were given birth, which was really, really lovely. And I mean, I was there my husband was there and my mum actually was able to come as well wow. given the circumstances which was absolutely yeah fantastic you know really really good the midwives were amazing um you know they they knew that obviously this wouldn't be easy you know yeah. never mind being in lockdown but I think that you know one of the real difficulties I had was like after you know we normally you would have um so the way they explained it to us was in the snowdrop room it was completely separate so that you could have anybody that you wanted to come in so it would be quite common for say um say you you, you know you've kind of gone through you've had your baby you've maybe lost your baby or they're they're, they're alive but they're not expected to live for too long what will happen is they will kind of open it up that friends family you know anybody who you feasibly want they will do as much as they can to kind of accommodate that um obviously for us that wasn't really an option because mm. of lockdown and you know it, it it was difficult and at the same time you know i think what we all just thought about was you know there's other babies here who we can't put at risk you know to kind mm -hmm. of just have mm -hmm. people coming in so mm -hmm. it was very very difficult but you know we understood why it was being done and, and we yeah. accepted that you know yeah I think acceptance is often such a helpful um, mindset isn't it to just realize the bigger picture and, and understand that it's not something personal you know that's being inflicted upon you yeah, definitely. Um, and I think, to be honest with you, I think that's one of the really fantastic things, uh, you know, from kind of finding soft and coming to soft was that realization that actually, you know, I'm not the only one who went through this. I'm not the only person um, who went through this um, in lockdown, um, mm -hmm. which is just really lovely sometimes to be able to kind of talk to somebody else and say, yeah, you know, that happened to me as well. And it was really difficult. And it's just it, it does take away that kind of feeling of isolation whenever you do speak to other people who've been through the same thing. Yeah. And Hannah, tell us about planning a funeral. I mean, it's just the, the most awful thing 
for a newborn baby, you know, when, no matter when you lose that baby, it's just such a tough, it's just not the way the world should work to be planning a funeral for a tiny baby. Um, so, you know, I understand how, how difficult that was, but could you talk to us about, um, you know, funeral arrangements and, you know, with the particular slant of, of lockdown as well? Of, of course. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I exactly as you said there, it's it's not ever an easy thing to do and it's not something anybody should ever have to do. You know, nobody should ever have to, to plan a funeral for their baby, but it, it can and does happen as, as we well know. Um, so for us, I mean, probably one of the biggest kind of um, if sort of challenges we had with that was at the time and um, so obviously we we're in Northern Ireland and I know there might have been different restrictions you know to other parts of the UK but um, during the time in Northern Ireland when when we were planning his funeral and um, basically funerals weren't really allowed they didn't really happen and um, so what happened was you could have up to I think it was up to 10 people but for us and and you know a, a thing that that happened that that was a, a real fantastic thing was the day so Killian was born on a Monday um, his funeral was on the Thursday and on that day the kind of the the guidelines changed where you could have 30 people instead of 10 people oh wow that was you know lucky I suppose is, is a funny word to use but yeah at least something good came of your situation yeah, like absolutely. I mean, it meant that we could have, you know, our, it meant we could have more friends with us. Mm -hmm. It meant that we could have more people there. Now, probably one of the, the biggest challenges I did find was just, even though we could have more people, we still couldn't really have like a, a funeral, so to speak. Um, you know, mm -hmm. what happened was we decided that um, we would have him cremated and we mm -hmm. went to the, the crematorium and we were allowed to go up to the door. So um, in Northern Ireland, the, the uh, crematorium is called Roselawn and we were allowed to go right up to the door of Roselawn but we weren't allowed to carry his coffin down to the little you know the little part that okay. I don't know the, the exact word for but the little part you know where it, it kind of goes on so yeah. we had to basically go to the door and we had to hand his coffin to the um the sort of two of the employees mm -hmm. and I mean they dealt with us with the absolute most compassion and they were absolute gentlemen they really really were but yeah. it was difficult not being able to do that final little you know that final kind of journey with them um but you know all in all even though it was very challenging like I said everybody was just fantastic the funeral director was the most she it, it was um she was um I can't remember her name actually I think it was Brenda but she was just amazing as well I mean she was so compassionate and um, so caring and just made sure that basically everything was all really dealt with for us um for us we decided that um, so that we we were in talks with a bereavement midwife um, who was amazing as well. She really was. But I remember at the time, you know, we were advised, you know, maybe do you, would you like to think about kind of having a hospital cremation? And we just said, you know, absolutely not. You know, that's yeah. most certainly not something that we want to think about. Yeah. So what happened was the way that I wanted it and the little bit of control that I kind of got to have, which I absolutely love, was in the hospital beside this no drop room there's it's called like a little kind of quiet room and it's a little room that's kind of made up it's it almost looks like a little church um mm -hmm. and you kind of go in and it's where you can sort of spend a couple of final moments um you know before you know you, your next stages mm -hmm. um and what happened was we went to the quiet room and the way that I wanted it was I wanted us to be with Killian in the quiet room right up until the funeral director arrived and that's okay. what happened was we were there and then the funeral director came and kind of took him on then from there so that was um that was really lovely just to know that I was in control of or we yeah. were in control I should say of of exactly what was going to happen yeah and and when you said that final goodbye to him I suppose um it's nice to be able to know um that was your choice Absolutely. Um, it's, it was just so, so important, I think, you know, to make sure that you do have choices and that those choices are respected, you know, as, mm. as far as is, is feasibly possible. Mm. Um, so that was really important to both of us. And it's, it's something, you know, to this day, we are very thankful was was able to happen. Lovely. Um, and Hannah, just on a, another practical level, how do you choose 30 people? Because, you know, funerals aren't normally by invitations. People normally just arrive at a funeral and, and show their love and support. but it must have been really tough to sit down and decide who are we going to include and who doesn't get to come to this funeral. How did you find that process? 
Do you know, it, it was very, very difficult. Um, I mean, we have got, um, so between Paul and myself, we have got, um, we both have our parents and we, between us have seven siblings. Wow. Um, so that kind of took up, you know, a bit of that. Um, and then we have um, a couple of partners in there as well, um, you know, who were invited. But I think in terms of that, I think we had our immediate family. We didn't really ask anybody, like my granny didn't come because I just didn't want to risk it. You know, it was it was yeah, right at the head of lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's just um, as much as obviously I wanted to make sure that anybody who wanted to be there could be there at the same time. I didn't want anybody to be taking on necessary risks, you know, yeah. at that time, because that just it, it wouldn't have been fair on them at all. Right. Um, yeah. We had a couple of our friends. Um, mm -hmm. We have two really, really good friends who are they're a married couple as well. And um, the um, our friend he actually lost a baby as well um yeah. so for them they were they really wanted to be there they did come yeah. and they were just really good supports as well you know for both yeah. of us um yeah. which was just great and um, yeah. so yeah we had really just immediate family and just kind of a couple of friends yeah. so yeah. I don't think we had I mean I don't think certainly we didn't put a pressure on ourselves to think right we must have 30 people but mm. it kind of gave us that leeway to think well yeah. it doesn't have to be 10 because yeah. if it was 10 it literally would have been parents and siblings and, and nobody else you know he would have been there mm, okay yeah so it made it a bit easier with with the numbers being increased and then were you allowed any sort of gathering afterwards a celebration a cup of tea I mean anything like that was that allowed um so at that time what we did do was we kind of had like just kind of a very very socially distanced kind of um little kind of gathering afterwards I know okay. that we couldn't have had you know we couldn't have um hired anywhere out you know mm -hmm. like a you know sometimes you might do it at, at a you know say you're maybe a member of a golf club or something like that you know yeah. and you want to go there that wouldn't have been feasible but um we did we had a very small very very socially distanced okay. kind of um after sort of um part form yeah, because um, to me, there's two parts of a funeral, isn't there? There's sort of the church service and the, or, or you know, the service, the more official part, and then there's the getting together with friends and family and chatting, and both have equal importance, and both are so part, so such important parts of that process that to have one without the other just doesn't feel quite right. So. I'm really pleased. I suppose it was summer as well. So doors and windows could be flung wide open. Um, and at least, you know, you could still gather and, and chat to people after because that's that's a big part of it. And people offering condolences and, you know, support. So that's, that's great that you got that. Definitely. And, and like I said, it, it is just just so important. Um, you know, I think as well, it's it's a real kind of like I like I said, I'm in um, obviously in Northern Ireland and um, we would very much be you know it's 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 a massive part of our culture you know to, to mm -hmm. kind of you know to have that and um mm -hmm. I think that's certainly um it, you know it was I think another thing I mean even to say that was important for me was typically speaking um I don't know if this maybe happens if this is a little bit different in other parts of the UK but I know in Northern Ireland what we tend to do is from on the day of the death we we traditionally have the funeral three days after um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a, a very important part of that process and the fact that Kellyanne passed away on the Monday and we were able to have the funeral on the Thursday mm -hmm. was important as well you know just mm -hmm. to kind of keep that little bit of culture so even though we maybe didn't get the full you know kind of the, the full thing that we wanted we were able to keep little kind of you know parts there yeah things that were important to you and that upheld your traditions okay that's good um and Hannah what would you say out of all of this? I mean, it's, it's a challenging situation to begin with, to lose your baby, um, to be under lockdown. What would you say was the most challenging thing that you faced? I think um, I will. I, I do think probably the, the most challenging part was I think there were there was there was quite a few parts. I think I'd probably say that that were, were that were really challenging, but certainly you know not being able to have as as full and as, as kind of proper a funeral as I would have wanted that was definitely a massive challenge um, and it is something that you know that was very very difficult and um, it did you know it, it did feel that you know you, you kind of know what you would want and you know exactly you know kind of where you'd want to go with it and that 
sort of being taken away almost was very very challenging and mm. um, I think as well just honestly I do think just the, the the whole the fact that it was locked down as well you know like we were discussing earlier the fact that you know we, you couldn't I mean in the in the kind of days and weeks after you know for us what we had kind of thought was we couldn't just we couldn't just go away anywhere you know we couldn't mm. just decide like you know let's let's just have mm. a few days away and um, mm. you know just completely just get a little bit of time a little bit of headspace yeah. and that I think was a bit of a challenge in itself as well mm. um I think it's, it's really hard to pinpoint you know kind of what was most challenging because mm. I, I do think there were a lot of challenges there but in saying that you know like I said although it was very challenging and I think it's very very important to be able to say you know it was a challenge it wasn't okay you know I, mm. I did struggle with it but mm. I was able to do you know this and that and I was able to kind of you know do different things yeah. um so although it's different and it's you know it, it is it's it's sad that it wasn't as, as it should have been I think it's good to accept that but also to look at what you were able to do as well again it's an attitude thing isn't it to try and find the things that you can be grateful for um in a really tough situation which you, you have so little control over I think to try and f- reframe things with gratitude and positivity can really help somebody to move forward as opposed to getting stuck in in a place of you know disappointment or anger or or whatever the the emotion may be um so it sounds like you guys did really well to make the most out of a really tough situation I think you know what we just did was we just thought you know even though we couldn't maybe have as, as full a day as we wanted, we still just made everything about Killian. You know, it was mm-hmm. all just about him. And it was just kind of making sure that, you know, um, you know, the day was for him, you know, and it, that was that was a, a really important mm-hmm. part of it. But yeah. I think it, it is important to be positive, but at the same time, I think it is important to also, you know, it's okay to accept, you know, mm-hmm. this is not okay. You know, if I've done mm-hmm. this and I've, I've you know, if I've had this loss and I've not been able to kind of do what I really wanted to do. So mm-hmm. it's okay to feel that way but I do think it is really important to look at at what you can do um Mm -hmm. because obviously now kind of looking back we know that we had a really lovely day for him and that we were able to do you know bits you know to to kind of make it a little bit more I don't think I'm explaining any of this very well no no I understand what you're saying 100% so you know you can look back and remember the special things that you were able to do and the the ways you 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 did remember him um and I very much resonate with what you're saying about not being able to go away and not even just locally, just things to be able to distract yourself and just keep busy. And, you know, a change of scenery at a time like that counts for so much. And um, we experienced the same, you know, we lost our daughter and under lockdown, it was, I think, the third lockdown or some, I lost count. <laughs> but um, we also had that feeling after the funeral, we just wanted to get away and we just couldn't. And it's just a time when you just want you know a different perspective and you just you just want a break really from everything um so yeah I really know what you're talking about when you when you say that was one of the things that you just naturally had had felt at the time it's just sometimes it's even just like whenever you you just kind of think it's like when you're in the same house and you're sort mm-hmm. of in the same yeah sometimes you just want to, to yeah. just get a real change of scene and just mm-hmm. a real change of headspace as well don't yeah. you you know um yeah. I'm sure you probably had the same sort of um the thing where you know you're kind of having to I mean afterwards when um you're having to kind of decide what to do with their things mm-hmm. um and that can obviously be it's, it's such a challenge you know there's it's it's not an easy thing to go through at all um yeah. and sometimes just to think you know something if I can just get away for a couple of days you know get into a different headspace and Mm. then I can come back and and decide you know what I want to do yeah and take that pressure off because for me a big thing was when do we do it I felt I didn't want to do it straight away but eventually we'd need to deal with it and when is the right time is it after a week is it after a month you just I really struggle with that um you know it was more the idea of when do I do it than, than actually doing it wasn't as bad it was difficult but um, sometimes you can get yourself in, like you say, mixed up in your own head, overthinking things and questioning, is it the right thing or not? So, yeah, a break and a change of scenery would have just taken the pressure off. Definitely. Um, on, on the actual, on the topic of, um, you know, kind of having, you know, having clothes and toys mm. and things to kind of mm. think about what to do with. Um, so the friends I talked about earlier, the kind of the, the couple of friends we have there, they're, yeah. they're, they're honestly just, they're, they're amazing friends and they're really good. And 
when I was I think about 25 weeks um, she had kind of given me like a lot of old clothes and you know things that um, her her little son had had and you know she, she kind of passed these things down to me and I remember on the day of the funeral I kind of said you know like you know would you like these things back you know that's fine if you want to take them back and she just said no like they're Killian's you know you decide what you want to do with them and Mm -hmm. it's such a small thing but looking Mm -hmm. you know looking back it's just giving you kind of that that little bit more control I think Mm -hmm. was just it was just lovely you know it was it was really nice yeah and just feeling like he had owned those things they, they belonged to him that was something of his so that's really special what a what a lovely friend um <laughs> but yeah really tough that you've both been through something similar um but I suppose at least you can support and understand each other and you know be there for each other in a way that a lot of friends just because they haven't been through it wouldn't be able to do the same yeah I mean she's she's so understanding I mean the at the it was actually her husband you know who she so she she, I mean her she has um two sons who are lovely and healthy and you know everything's all great there but she had obviously supported him through you know when it so for him it had happened very like a lot earlier in his life and it's one of those things where I think as as we will find quite often is maybe say something happens a long time ago you know say you maybe you you go through a miscarriage or you go through a loss of a baby a long time ago you maybe don't want to talk about it and actually some sometimes maybe you know 10 15 years later those feelings can kind of come back again and you think you know mm-hmm. actually I've been through this and I didn't really talk about it so I think she mm-hmm. was really instrumental in kind of supporting him through you know a little bit later on down the line yeah. lovely okay Hannah well it's been lovely talking to you I'm not sure if there's anything else um that you'd like to mention before we sort of sign off but um, it's been really interesting hearing hearing your perspective on last during lockdown you know, I thank you so much again for having me. Um, I think probably just the, the kind of main message is that, you know, whenever you are, I know that it may not be, and I, I certainly hope that we're not going to have any more of these experiences where pe- people have to go through this during another lockdown. But I think it's just even, you know, if you if it ever would happen it's just to know that whatever decision that you make there's no right or wrong decision it's just trying to make sure that you're doing the right thing for you and that you know as 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 far as is feasibly possible your choices and and what you want to do is is being respected and is is being accommodated that's lovely well thank you so much Hannah thank you very much